Well, good morning. good morning. It's good to be with you here this morning. And I'm always pleased when I stand up and I say this to the fellowship at Long Clawson Baptist Church, where I'm the pastor. It's always good to see some smiling faces. And I see some here this morning in all of you. And it's good to have the children with us too. Just a little bit about myself, really. Perhaps don't know me. Maybe you've not even heard of me. But... Stephen has been over a few times to share God's word with us and his family have a long standing connection with our church there. Um, his grandfather was uh, the pastor at Long Clawson for many, many years and I bring greetings from the fellowship there. We're only a small fellowship, perhaps up to about 15 people attending at our services and I've been the pastor there called by God five years ago. 30 years in the making. <laughs> the Lord revealed to me 30 years before I became pastor that at some time I would be pastor. But it's took a long time to deal with me and the Lord has had his hand on me, moulding me. And it was um, Vernon Salkeld. I don't know if you've heard of Vernon. He was the one um, in a supermarket aisle, actually. <laughs> we were in there and I saw him coming towards me with a trolley and we had a chat and caught up what was going on and we were parting and all of a sudden I felt this hand on my shoulder and it was Vernon saying Martin I think you'll be a good fit at Long Clawson and the, the five years I've spent as pastor there the Lord has blessed our time together and has blessed me I have three children um, the eldest, who's come back to live with us, we don't seem to be able to get rid of him, He's, uh, he'll be 32 this year. Um, and then I've got uh, two daughters, my eldest daughter, she's married, and we have a little grandson who's 18 months old, and my youngest daughter who lives with my eldest daughter at the moment because she wanted to try a halfway house because she's looking to, hopefully in the next year or so, buy her own place, and she wanted to see what it was like away from mum and dad. That's what she tells us anyway. <laughs> but it's good to be here this morning. I became a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ um, in 1989. And that took a bit of work as well. I'm not always the easiest of person to get on with, as you, my wife would testify if she was here to say. So I'm glad she's at, at Clawson, actually. But there we go, because I don't know what she might say about me. But as we come together here, we come around God's word. A God who loves us, who's gracious to us, shows his mercy towards us, and we have so much in him, don't we? Well, just one further thing. When I come to sing our last hymn from the front here, because you won't have been able to hear me over there, I'm not always in tune, and I'm not always in rhythm with the music. So I apologise to the musicians, and it's been lovely having you playing for us. But usually I tell people now to lock the doors at the back so that people can't get out when I start the singing. But there we go. So to our passage. Paul, as you would have heard, I'm sure last week, has been telling Timothy that difficult times will be coming. More difficult times will be coming. And... He's telling Timothy, you, Timothy, are not to be like these others. And then he goes on to help Timothy know how he can stand against the false teachers that will be coming and all the things that they will face. I don't know, some of you might be a little too young to remember Dad's army. When he was on... One of those in Dad's army was Fraser, and he was a Scotsman and an undertaker, um, so it always interested me because I've worked in the funeral profession now for 20 years, first as a, a funeral director for nine years, and then now for the last 12 years, independently taking funeral services. And his catchphrase was always, we're doomed. <laughs> and it might be that some who are new in the faith at the time here 
when Paul is talking to Timothy, might have thought that they were in for an easy life as a Christian and might have been thinking, when Paul starts talking about what's going to come, that we're doomed. But that's not what Paul says. Paul says, let me show you, Timothy, what will help you, how you will get through this. And we know that Paul considers Timothy a son in Christ. And he's been preparing him for it is Timothy who will take over from Paul and continue God's work. I don't know whether you're into sport. I like a lot of sport, watching sport over and over. And soon, as you've got coming up your event, your, the Olympics will come. And one of the most exciting things in the Olympics for me is the athletics and the relay races and the handing over of the baton. Well, that's what God wants from us too. As Christians, as we live our lives day by day, Part of it also is to pass on the baton for those who will follow, who will continue in the faith and continue sharing the gospel, telling others about the wonderful good news of the Lord Jesus Christ and salvation through him. And so we must always remember to pray for our children and young people and for those who teach them because as they come through and they come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Saviour, they will be the ones who will be continuing on, sharing that gospel until the Lord Jesus returns, whenever that might be. And none of us know when that will happen. Now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the Lord Jesus Christ will come. Yes, we're in the end times. And things are going to get worse. There's no covering it over and looking through rose tinted glasses. The Bible tells us that things will get worse and worse. And so. We have to be prepared and we have to prepare those who follow. And that's what Paul's doing with Timothy. He's preparing him. And how can he, Timothy, stand up against these that will come? These who will bring this false teaching. These who will try and lead people astray and take them down paths that they shouldn't be going. Well, there are two things here that Paul tells Timothy. He tells him to be different and stand alone, or stand firm, because we are to be different. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, we read there, this is what Paul says in his letter. Do not conform to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And so I just want us to look under two headings at these verses that Jeff read to us from 2 Timothy chapter 3. And let's look at the past. Verse 10 tells us, you, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance. So Paul's talking to things that have already happened. And then to the present, verse 14, where Paul says, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and become convinced of, because you know those from whom you've learned it. So he's to continue in the things that he's learned, to continue to live his life in that way. And so first, looking back, Paul tells him to look back. He's not telling him to live in the past, because sometimes we can do that. How many times over the years have you heard people say, well, in my day, I've heard it over and over, over the years. And you talk about things I would listen um, to my mum and dad's, music choices and they would listen to mine and they were going what's that rubbish you're listening to it wasn't like in our day and that's where it was but Paul's not telling Timothy to live in the past to live on things that we've done in the past where we've seen perhaps things happen to us 
He's not talking about that here. Because even though we learn from the past, we're continuing our journey with the Lord Jesus Christ each and every day. John Stott tells us that we must relate an, uh, to an unchanging world to a chain, sorry, an unchanging word to the changing world. We must stick to the word which doesn't change, but we must relate that word, word to the world we live in and know how we can tell others that they, how they will understand it, what they will pick up. If we start talking about things that are from years ago, if the children were in here now and I started talking about certain things that I did as a child or watched as a child or learned at school as a child, that would probably be completely different and they wouldn't have a clue what I was talking about. I'd have to talk to them about things that they understood, things that they're aware of, how they would pick up these things and understand. Paul tells him, remember the sound teaching I have given you, Timothy. Do not be swayed by the false teaching and the false teachers who will come. You see, Timothy is not a raw recruit. Timothy is not completely just new in the faith at this particular point. Paul has given Timothy lots of sound teaching. And he's taken that teaching in. And that's what we're to do. As we receive the teaching from God's word, as we read it day by day and meditate upon it and think about what it's saying to us, we're to take those things in. We're to learn from them. And why is that? Well, in our no normal human nature, that side of us, we more easily embrace things that are in line with human thinking. When you go and tell somebody that a scientist says this, that or the other, people are more easily willing to listen to that even though they may not know what he's talking about than they would if you go and tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ and what's in God's word and that God's word hasn't changed and is absolutely faultless. But they'll listen more to the scientists than they would to you. You see, we need to test everything against God's word. As brought by Paul here to Timothy, he says, I've been teaching you from the word you remember the Bereans? The Bereans were commended for testing everything against God's word and making sure that it was what God's word says and it was in line with God's word. Because God's word is the absolute truth. When we read it, we can rely on it because there is no errors in it. There is no fault. It is the absolute truth upon which we can stand. And when we learn from God's word, it causes us to pursue a course that is opposite to that followed by those who are mentioned in verses 1 to 9. You see, standing firm is the acid test of our faith as we resist the devil's schemes as we fix ourselves upon God's truth as our anchor in our life day by day how do we stand up when our faith is attacked how do we stand do we stand firm or do we not well, Paul says to Timothy, you need to stand firm on God's word, on what you've learnt. Stick to it. That's your anchor. That's the thing to hold on to. That's the thing to test whatever comes to you to make sure that it's true. I don't know about you, but I like my food. And when people come along and say, oh, there's this fantastic 
dish they're now serving here at this place? Well, you have to go and test it, don't you? <laughs> and see what it's like. And that's testing it. Testing it. Well, when teaching comes to you, we need to test it against God's word to see that it's in line with his word. And if it isn't, then we don't follow it. But Paul here isn't just saying that. He's not just saying, whatever I've told you, Timothy, that's what you to live on. You're not just to accept and believe what I've, I'd say, but look at my life, Timothy. You've watched me live my life day by day. You know how I live my life. And you know that my life backs up what I say. And here to me was one of the greatest challenges in my life. Does my life back up what I tell people about the Lord Jesus Christ? What I'm trying to tell them day by day? You see, people are trying to persuade people all the time by their words. You know, I went to, when I was a funeral director, there was one particular person who used to take services and I couldn't understand a word they were saying. They used these long words that I'd never even heard of in my life before, all through it, and I didn't know what they were saying during the time they were taking their services. And some people you listen to, and then when they come out of, come out of the service and you watch them away from their work, whatever they're trying to say doesn't back up the way that they live. Paul says... You know, Timothy, just by looking at my life, that what I'm telling you is lived out by me day by day in the strength that God gives me to do that day by day. You see, the thing is that the Christian life isn't easy. We can't live it by ourselves. We need God's strength in us day by day by his spirit that he gives it to each one who believes in him. And the power of the Spirit works within us. That power that raised Christ from the dead is in us. Each one of us as believers have that power. So we don't have to rely on us. We might feel that we're weak, we're frail. But with, that, with God's Spirit within us, Holy Spirit, we have the power that raised Christ from the dead to help us day by day. But we do have to live our lives in a way that backs up what we're trying to tell people. It's no good saying one thing and then people seeing us out of church, living our lives in a different way. We need to show people what we're telling them. And that was a challenge to me. What would people say about me? I often say that when I'm taking funeral services. I say, what would you say about this person? How would you describe them to me if I came round and talked to you? Would you say the same things as I've just been sharing with you from the family's information about their life? And what would the people around me and you say about our lives? How would they describe us? What would they say about us? Would they say that we are God's people? Would they say that we live our lives day by day and that the Lord is the priority in our life and the way that we live our life shows how much we love the Lord day by day. Well, it's a real challenge to us. Well, Paul says to Timothy, you know. He says, you know all about my teaching, of my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance. Paul's lived out what he believed and has taught. But he goes on to say, that's not the only thing. He says, what also testifies to what I've been saying to you, and that it's true, Timothy, and that you should rely on it and live your life in that way, is the persecutions that I have faced in my life. 
Why would I go through all these persecutions in my life, Timothy, if it was not on the basis of what I believe? And we know what Paul went through. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 21 to 33, it lists out all the severe suffering that Paul has gone through. Suffering that the Lord said he would go through to be his servant to the Gentiles. If you want to read it, read it for yourselves. And he says to Timothy, he says, not just believe what I tell you, but believe because of my life and also my sufferings. And then he particularly picks out the sufferings that he faced at Antioch, Iconium and Lystra. And you see, those may have been the ones that Timothy may have seen personally. You see, he was a citizen of Lystra. So he may have been there when Paul was going through the sufferings he faced there. Or, because those three are in the local area of where Timothy was, even if he wasn't there, it's something that he may have heard from others who have testified to this man Paul, who talked about the Lord Jesus Christ, and the sufferings he went through. And Paul testifies. He says, you can trust the Lord, Timothy, whatever you may face. Because he says there in verse 11, yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. All of them. He said, the Lord rescued me from all of these persecutions that I faced and that I had to endure. So what I've told you, I've lived out. And you can see it too because I've faced all these sufferings because of what I believed. And what I've told you is the truth. And I've been able to do that because of the Lord, because he has saved me strengthened me and helped me in all of these things. But Paul goes on to say that it's not just me. He says, it's not just me who you can look at, Timothy, but it's others too, because you will see this in all who desire to live a godly life. In Christ Jesus. We can go back to John's Gospel. Chapter 16 verse 33. Or chapter 15. Verse 18 to 21. Where the Lord Jesus tells his disciples. You will face persecutions. Because the world has hated me. They will hate you. And you will face tribulations. And difficulties in your life. If you're trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. And as Jeff was telling us. That might come in various forms. Here in this country, in the main, as he said, we face very little by way of persecution. Perhaps a word here or a word there. There was a man who lived on my street. And I tried to tell him about the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ and I talked to him on different subjects and we talked quite a lot. But he made it absolutely clear. He said, don't you go telling me about what's in the Bible and the Lord Jesus Christ because I don't want to know. So don't even go there. And he looked at me with that stern face to say, you're going to get some kind of comeback if you keep telling me about the Lord Jesus Christ. But we don't face as Carter and Eason faced imprisonment, torture and even death for our faith at this particular time. But who's to say that that might change in years to come? We might we need to be prepared. No wonder Paul is giving Timothy an example. You see, we can point people to the Lord Jesus Christ, who's the perfect example. But it's easy to say, well, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the Son of God. Of course he can go through that suffering and deal with it. Paul says, look at me, Timothy. 
I'm just like you, just another human being. Look at others who've also living their lives in Christ Jesus day by day. And you'll see it. You'll be able to look at them and know what they're telling you is the absolute truth because you can see it in their lives and you can see it through the things that they face. I don't know how I'd be able to deal with the things that Carter and Eason face there in Afghanistan and other countries in our world where persecution is so severe. But I know that the Lord Jesus Christ would keep me in it if I was in that situation. But we can look to them too and not only pray for them, but they can be an encouragement to us because we see their faith and see how the Lord Jesus Christ has helped them, has been with them, has kept them through all the things that they faced. Often they're disowned by their families, thrown out of their communities and villages, lose their jobs, lose everything that they have. And yet when they talk about their saviour, they're so sincere about the love that they receive from God, grace and mercy, and they talk about him in such a way. And sometimes I feel that we perhaps are not the same because we don't face those kind of things. We seem to have this... We're just going along and it's nice and easy and we, you know, we tell people but we don't have the same impact. Perhaps because we're not living our lives in the way that God wants us to. Does our lives back that up? That's why it was such a challenge to me when I was preparing. How does my life stand up when others see me? When others see me living my life day by day? Paul, as we said, is the mentor to Timothy. And he tells him to look at all that you've learned, all that I've been teaching you. Look at my life and the life of all those in Christ Jesus. And know that what you've been told is the truth and check it against God's word. But then he tells him in the present, just quickly, the second point. Verse 14, but as for you, continue in what you have learned we're not just to learn it and put it away I don't know about you but if someone was to test me now on the things that I was taught at school I think I'd fail very badly because a majority of the stuff that I learned at school I have never used um, the only time it gets of use sometimes is something comes from the back of my mind on some quiz show that I might be watching and something comes up and you go actually I remember that from school but most of the stuff is just forgotten but we're not to forget the things that we've been taught that's why as we learn these things and meditate on them and think about them the Holy Spirit can bring those things back to us to help us in the present to help us through what we might be facing I don't know what each of you are going through at the moment in your own lives what things you're facing I do know that Christ can help you through it, can help you deal with it. And if there's anybody who doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Saviour, turn to him now in repentance, confess your sins, accept that you're a sinner in rebellion against God and that you want to change your life and turn to him for your salvation. And he's there waiting with open arms to welcome you. He wants to be there for you. He wants to show you what he has for you, the blessings that he's got for you. And he will keep you and help you. And as we said, he doesn't promise that you won't go through difficult times, but he promises he'll be there alongside you, helping you and strengthening you for whatever you might face and whatever you might need to go through. You see, the things that we learnt, the things we learn, they're to become second nature to us to become automatic when I was younger I used to play a lot of table tennis um, I used to play in, in a league in Rutland and Stamford and over the years as I practiced and practiced certain things became second nature I didn't even have to think about what kind of shot I was going to play seeing what shot the other person had played it just seemed to come automatically and that's what it should be with God's word for us 
We should be able to have a situation and God's word should come to our minds. By the Spirit, we'll bring it back to us because we've learnt it. We've taken it on board. We've thought about it. You see, we need to be assured of the things that we've learnt. That's why it's so important about teaching children. Because the more that they learn those things at an early age, as they go through their lives, things come back to them. You know, we were, I was, had the privilege with one or two other people when I was at Welby Lane Mission in Melton of running a youth club for, for, for some of the uh, young people on our estate. We used to get about 36 young people come along. And, you know, they had some strange ideas. They thought Christians were the ones who had the dog collars. I thought, well, there weren't many Christians then, are there? <laughs> if that's what they thought. But one of the things that you never knew is what they were taking away. I saw one of them, who's now in his late 20s, early 30s, who was at the youth club. And he says, we always remember you, lead, the, you who were the leaders at our youth club. And we talk about you still to this day. How you taught us the right ways to live our life. And about the Lord Jesus Christ and what he'd done for us. And they haven't given their lives to the Lord, not yet. But they remember those things that we taught them at youth club. Even, if even though they had no idea about what, who Jesus was or anything to do with the Bible. So it is. And we remember, don't we, from Paul's first letter to Timothy. How Timothy had not only learned these things from Paul, but he'd been taught them by his grandmother Lois and his mother Eunice. They had told him about the Lord Jesus Christ. And by now, through his life where he got to, although he's a young man, he knew these things. And he could have been assured of them because the Holy Spirit has now applied them to his heart. And that's what he's trying to tell Timothy in the second part. He says, how can we be assured of these things? Well, it's from where it comes. Sometimes you're able to say, by looking at people or knowing people, whether you trust what they're telling you or not. You can look and go, mm, I'm not sure about that's right, what they're telling me. Paul says, as you live day by day, you can be assured because we are bringing you the authority of God's word. This is not something that's made up by man. This is what God has breathed. Verse 16, all scripture is God breathed. It's something that comes from God himself. And as one commentator puts it, it's the handbook of salvation. You see, we cannot know from human exploration or discovery the way of salvation. You can read about it, but it only becomes true when it reaches into your heart. That's not the pumping thing in the middle of our bodies, it's the inner us. When the Spirit brings it home to our hearts, convicts us of our sin, that's when it becomes real. So it doesn't matter how much people study the Bible, if they don't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Saviour and the Holy Spirit has not come into their lives, they'll not know the truth that God wants to reveal from his word, the truth of salvation. It's not only is it all from God, all scripture is God breathed, so every single word in God's word is from God himself. And he says, not only that, but there's great benefits from it. It's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. People will tell me that exercise is good for me. Well, when I do exercise, I just ache and feel painful <laughs> afterwards. Perhaps it's because I'm getting a bit older. Um, but God's word is not the same. God's word has a blessing with it because it's useful for all of these things. The Holy Spirit brings so much out of God's word. Talking a few times,
times when we've been sharing with people at Long Clawson and we've been hearing something from God's word and we'll go, I've listened to that yet. Loads of times, that, that uh, story, that, that thing we read in God's word. I didn't even know that verse existed in, that, in there. I must have missed it. Because God brings the different things out to us day by day. And it's useful. All of it is useful for us. And God opens it up to our hearts by his spirit. Through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So just to conclude, we're coming to an end. I'm sorry I've kept you a little bit longer. Paul says, these things will come, these false teachers. But one thing to remember, Timothy, is that they will go from bad to worse. So whatever they bring is actually making things worse. It's no benefit to you. But you're not to live like that. Follow the teaching that I have brought. Watch my life and my sufferings. You'll be able to see that what I'm telling you is how I live my life and how I deal with things that come my way. And then live it out today in your life. And you can be assured of it because God's word is from God, not made up by man. And as you do so, you'll be able to stand up and combat all of these false teachers and teaching that comes your way. Well, let's stand together and sing our final hymn, which is 428. Lord, for the years your love has kept and guided, urged and inspired.